Welcome everybody in, in our seminar in the new time in, uh, in October. So today we have a pleasure to host uh, Ing uh, Long, who is a postdoc in the group of uh, Janek Kwodinski in Center for Optical Quantum Technologies of the University of Warsaw. And uh, Ing will be telling us about effects, like destructive effects that noise, measurement noise have uh, on quantum metrology. So it's great to have you, Ing, the screen is yours. Thank, yeah. thank you. My pleasure to be here. And thanks for the introduction. So as I said, I'm Ing Long and I'm working with uh, Janek in the um, Center for Quantum Optical Technologies. And today I'm presenting our work, which is, as you can see in this uh, archive paper, with the title Quantum Metrology with Imperfect Measurements. So this work is not just done between the two of us. We also have uh, great inputs from our collaborators, in particular Tuvia, who is now in uh, Caltech, and also Alex Retzka, who is uh, kind of officially affiliated to uh, Hebrew University of uh, Jerusalem, and he's now also in California. Okay, so kind of a, a quick uh, introduction. Okay, in this business of uh, quantum metrology or quantum sensing, and uh, the, the ultimate goal is we would like to sense or estimate a parameter. Okay, in general, it should, it should be a family of parameters, but let's focus now on just a single parameter. So we would like to estimate this parameter, for example, the strength of the magnetic field, temperature even, maybe or the strength of the gravitational field. And we would like to utilize this, we would like to utilize quantum features in our sensors or our probes, for example, squeezing, entanglement, such that we would like to achieve a very high precision of our estimation. And in particular, we would like to go beyond the so-called standard scaling, which means that our estimation precision, in this case, scales linearly with the probe size. So this is like the classical uh, limits that we will have. And with quantum features, then in particular, people have shown that we can estimate these uh, parameters with a precision that scales now quadratically with respect to the prop size, using, for example, a GSE state, a spin squeeze state, and then maybe you, we, me we measure the parity operators and so on. So this is kind of uh, well known. So this excitement of a sc uh, Heisenberg scaling, uh, I mean, uh, on the practical side, these quantum sensors, I mean, it has two stages. So. The first stage, of course, is the encoding stage or the sensing stage where you, you fit in your prepared prop states, the state could be entangled, into, to sense the parameter. For example, you put it into the field. And then usually this is done in a way that is well protected from uh, kind of a noise from the environment, such that you would have high coherence and high sensitivity. But on the other hand, of course, after you have done this uh, encode, encoding this uh, information of the parameters, you want to read it out. So for that, you need to do measurements on this probe. And usually this measurement is not, dir not, not done directly on the probe itself in the sense of you, know, you, you really touch it, but it is kind of indirect usually, for example, with the optical result method. So, and then ultimately it is, connected to a classical detection device. For example, I mean, with uh, um, auto number detectors. Uh, yeah. So this is basically the picture we have. So we have the encoding stage and then we have the readout stage. And then uh, historical, historically, of course, uh, this, uh, this uh, exciting results from Heisenberg scaling, for example, is first derived by assuming a noiseless quantum metrology. So in a sense that we can do arbitrary state preparation, the encoding is perfect, there's no uh, disturbance during the encoding stage. And then we can also do arbitrary measurements that we want to extract the information. But in reality, of course, um, we know that there'll be noise somewhere and usually it's not, we just can't 100% cancel them. So in, indeed, uh, like maybe, 10 plus years ago, people started to looking into the noise. In particular, people first focus on the noise during the encoding stage. 
so for so one of the most popular noise is the kind of is the family of noise of decoherence. And then it can be shown that this kind of decoherent noise, for example, can be uh, effectively incorporated together with the uh, encoding stage. I mean, the, the one, the, the perfect encoding stage, which is uh, described by, for example, unitary dynamics. And as a whole, then you will have a effective non-unitary dynamics probably, but okay. Um, but of course, still preserved uh, trace. So, for, so in general, it will be less, let's say a CPT female. And then in this case, however, however, it has been shown that for this kind, for this most general kinds of decoherence noise, the Heisenberg scaling will be lost in general. And then your precision will now be reduced to a standard scaling. So this is the unfortunate part. Uh, sorry, Ing, but what I remember, there were some like funny cases in which you can like restore this uh, this Heisenberg scaling, like when like somehow when your let's say when your generator somehow in some sense was perpendicular to the noise in like or some operators associated to your yes like, yes yes yes. So I said this is this uh, third point. So. Further, uh, uh, later in the uh, more recent years, so for example, people have kind of uh, studied the structure of the noise better. And in a sense, people find that, okay, if your noise has certain structures, as you say, then actually this, uh, you can cleverly kind of avoid this noise. Um, and I mean, the, the analysis looks a little bit similar to the so-called quantum error correction techniques, where you look at, uh, there will be a similar conditions to the, in so-called canoe Laplace conditions where you can see if you satisfy certain conditions, then actually you can avoid the noise and you can restore back your Heisenberg scaling. So yes. So this is the kind of the progress on how people deal with noise during the sensing stage. So on the other hand, there's also the second stage, which is the readout stage. And then uh, unfortunately, there is uh, not much has been done there. In particular, this readout noise is also very important because why? Uh, it is quite common actually, for example, in your detectors, you have crosstalks or you have um, cross grains or finite resolutions of your uh, measurements. So these noise are there, I mean, uh, in any um, realistic uh, measurement device. So the important thing is that we find that this noise cannot be effectively translated into an equivalent version of the effective encoding. In other words, we cannot kind of just commute the noise into a decoherent noise during the encoding stage. So it has to be dealt differently. And as said, before our work here, we find that there's a lack of general analysis in the literature. In particular, it is not so sh there's no general results on um, saying that under what condition or whether it's even possible to have um, uh, mitigation of this noise, such as, for example, we still keep, we will still have a perfect, uh, 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 perfect precision in the end, and we will be able to restore the Heisenberg scaling, or we we are stuck with a standard scaling. So, this is the background of this uh, uh, whole, whole whole scenario. So, a quick summary of uh, what I'm going to uh, tell you in details later, and is that in this work, we systematically study this situation with imperfect measurements. In particular, we demonstrate that the central figure, which is the quantum fissure information, has to be modified. And moreover, we kind of propose uh, ways or methods to evaluate this uh, modified quantum fissure information. And then moreover, we also proved a Gauss theorem, which st states that if we are allowed to do a global control operations just before the readout stage, then this readout noise can actually be compensated for almost fully. And therefore, actually, in this case, the Heisenberg scaling can be restored. On the other hand, if this uh, control operations before the readout noise is restricted to be local control operations, then we find that the readout noise cannot be compensated fully, can, cannot be compensated for fully, and therefore you are stuck with a standard scaling. 
So these are the three main results that uh, I will kind of present uh, from now. Okay, so far, uh, any questions? Uh, so this, yes. uh, those results concern like the kind of most general type of measurement noise. I understand that you do, uh, assume that it is uh, non-local then. Yeah, or uh, is I... it correct? Okay, um, we currently we are focused on local noise. That's it, that is okay. Correct. I see. So you are focusing on the local I noise, and, a, and yeah. still you have this uh, those results that require like uh, global operations. Uh, yes. So it's nice. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So let me go into the. Uh, let me all set up now the problem like, mathematically. So. Okay, uh, in this uh, business of metrology with imperfect measurement, so as the beginning part is the same as usual. So we would have a d dimensional, we have a q d probe living in a d dimensional Hilbert space row that we assume we can arbitrarily uh, initialize. And then we fit it into um, the, the channel that encodes the parameter of interest. And then, therefore, the states after the encoding is given by, for example, in this case, for a unitary encoding, then it is just this unitary transformation. So the results, our results need not just be restricted to unitary, but uh, let's just take it to be unitary for now. And then, so this encoded state now contains this theta part dependence, and therefore we were able to retrieve it. And of course we do measurements, and in particular, we focus on here. Okay, here let, let us just first focus on uh, projective measurements. So uh, label by pi i. And then moreover, we are allowed to choose the basis of this uh, projective measurement. So I would, we will be able to do a rotation v5, five specifying the, the parameters for the unitary, for example. So, so this is. So far, so good. And then the outcomes, the probability of getting the outcomes i for the projected i is, of course, given by the Born's rule. So uh, in this case, if there's no noise, then that's all. Now, with imperfect measurement, as say, with the readout noise, now this outcome i is not what we observed immediately, however. What we really observe is another set of outcome x, which is Combined, which is basically obtained from uh, mix, mixings of these uh, outcomes i. And therefore, the POVMs that we measure in the end, the effective POVM that we measure in the end, are no longer projectives, but rather it is given by, for example, mx is sum over, uh, is a weighted sum of these uh, projective measurements. So this weighted sum is weighted basically by a stochastic map, which basically all the transitional matrix that tells us if I had the outcomes i, then what is the probability of getting the observed outcome x? So, so this is described by mathematically a stochastic map p. So now because of this mixing, then these effective p of m elements are no longer projectives, and therefore of course. The probability now, the corresponding prob probability of observing outcome x is still given by the Bonds rule, but now with this effective POVM elements. And then here there's a phi where we must, not, we must not forget. Before this, we still have the freedom to rotate the basis. So this, so the mx without phi is before the rotation. Remember, whenever mx phi, then that is after the rotation. So of course, for each, each each round, we only get a single x outcomes. So if we want to get uh, the probability distribution, then we need to sample it over many rounds new. And in particular, ideally new should be very large. And let's say going to infinity mathematically. Okay. So it is from these new repetitions that we would like to const uh, reconstruct an estimator for the true value of the parameter theta. And let's say we you know, estimate it by theta tilde. In particular, we always consider unbiased estimator here, 
which means on average, our estimators should be converging to the true value of the parameter. And then now we quantify our estimate, the precision of our estimators by the standard uh, measure, which is the mean square error, which is basically uh, is the, on average, what is, how far is our estimators spreading from the true values. So this is the mean square error. And standard statistical results tells us that, well, it's a very convenient uh, lower bound on this uh, mean square error, which is the inverse of the Fisher information. And of course, Fisher information, as you all probably know well, can be expressed as sum over all the um, of this uh, term, which is the derivatives of the probability probabilities squared divided by the probabilities, and then sum over different uh, x's. Uh, in this talk, when we see a dot, then it's derivative with respect to theta. So this is the Cromerang bound, which uh, I guess everyone knows, and this is for any given, uh, so this is for any given input states, input plot states, and any choice of measurement. There will be one corresponding uh, underlying probability distribution, and therefore the underlying Fisher information. So of course we cannot try to optimize over the measurement basis, the phi vector, as well as the input states. So if we optimize over the first the measurement basis, then for that given state, we said after the maximization, it's called quantum deficient information. And in particular, because of the, the restriction in the measurement. So now, although we are able to optimize over the choice of the um, uh, measurement basis, but you still have this constraint of the structure of the ultimate uh, effective P of M element. So it is a constraint maximization. And therefore we put the, to be very explicit, we put uh, this uh, int for the imperfect uh, specifying, we are looking at this uh, imperfect versions. And similarly, if we now further optimize over the input states, then we have the so-called channel QFI, or I should say imperfect channel QFI, which is a feature information optimized over both the measurement basis with the constraints of imperfect measure uh, of imperfections, as well as the input states row. And so now, of course, ultimately then the optimal precision or the optimal mean square error that uh, we will have is lower bounded by the imperfect channel QFI. Yeah. And the point is that uh, if mu is large enough, if it's simple large enough for the distribution, then this will be basically uh, equality. Okay, so this is the setup of it. And as said, the point is uh, because of these maximizations in both the quantum Fisher information as well as the channel QFI, we have the, the constraints on the imperfect measurements, or not, in other words, the measurement operators. This maximization is not necessarily easy to evaluate nor compute. And this is in a strong contrast with the scenario with perfect measurements where you could do arbitrary measurements of your liking. And in that case, the explicit expression for the now perfect quantum feature information as well as perfect channel QFI can be, I mean, people have uh, able to compute it rather easily and it's well known. And not just the, Q, the Fisher information itself, but rather the measurements that goes with it, as well as the optimal state that goes with it. So in particular, uh, you know very well, for example, given any state, the optimal measurement can be chosen to be the uh, projections onto the eigenkets of the so-called SLD. And then moreover, the optimal states, you can choose to be the equal superposition of the uh, largest and smallest eigenvectors of the generators. So these are all uh, well known in the case of perfect measurements. But here, because of the constraints, we don't have this one. Um, sorry, can I ask? Uh, I mean, as you, I mean, you said that uh, in the absence of noise, when you are allowed to do any measurement, then uh, the optimal measurement is projective, right? So I understand that this is not exactly the scope of uh, like your work here, because you assume that you do projective measurements and uh, then you have some noise. But what if you have 
just some class of noise, uh, class of noise measurements that you can do, maybe on a large system even, uh, is it then, but let's say the noise is always the same in some sense, like, would it, uh, would you expect then that the optimal measurement would be, I don't know, non-projective, for example, or would, would they be always projective? Um, I'm not sure if I, I'm not sure if I get your question exactly. You're saying that. So assume that you're, that you're, that you have some model of measurement noise, like let's say, uh, the same, let's say noise per qubit that you use. Okay. It's a fixed not like measurement noise, but you can, so, but, and then you are, you want to do your metrology, maybe with ancillas, right? And then you will be potentially probing your ancillas also with a, with a uh, like, uh, you'll be measuring the, the combined system. Uh, but then like, would the optimal measurement sort of, because I understand that you, I mean, the setting that I'm describing is that you, perform some measurement and then you have this measurement noise. And then the question is, would, would optimal measurement always be projective in this case also, or? Uh... Mm. So my, my naive understanding is we know that uh, the, the projective measurements on the eigen basis of the SLD is sufficient. And then mm -hmm. uh, the question is whether even, okay, even with, now, if I okay, my question is maybe a bit vague, so maybe you can, yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay, so I'm not exactly understanding the question. Yeah, so maybe it just helps to understand it, but I think in long, I think Michal's question is good, but we don't consider it. In a sense, I, can, can I rephrase your question, Michal, like this: that I give you again the measurement noise, but the mod model of the perfect measurement is projective measurements on some other kind of probes and some ancillas, okay? Mm -hmm. And I add the measurement noise like we do. Do we have like a proof that the measurement I should choose will always be projective, right? And I think- Yeah, or you don't, or you don't need to use ancillas. Or you um, don't need to use it. And yeah. I think we never, okay. For me, it would be surprising if it's not probably some convexity arguments, but we haven't proved that. I think our answer that we can give today in long is that our motivation was that in this perfect scenario that is here, everyone knows that if I have n probes, it's enough to do local projective measurements. Yeah. So we just add a bit of noise on those and then we do our analysis. Sure. So sure. the starting point is the perfect analysis. Whereas for your scenario, I think the starting point would be already something different than perfect analysis yeah sort of like assuming like different way to maybe mitigate uh, the effects of noise via engineering auxiliary system by, by adding uh, auxiliary yeah. system so for this example. i think okay. we cannot answer yet right so thanks okay okay uh yeah that's it uh we don't have this um beautiful results for when we have imperfect measurements. So then that's where we stop. Then we don't stop here, however, of course. And instead, this is the first part of our result. I mean, result is that we now show that there's a link between the imperfect quantum fission information with the perfect quantum fission information. And okay, let me read it out loud. So in particular, we should we prove there's a lemma one here, which says that. For any pure encoded prop state, uh, we cover this encoded prop state, and any imperfect measurement M, the imperfect QFI is related to the perfect QFI by a constant of gamma M, where gamma M looks like uh, equation two, and it is a quantity that is bounded between zero and one. And importantly, it depends only on the imperfect measurement. So here the maximization in equation two is maximization of uh, all pairs of orthogonal pure states. And therefore, since this gamma M factor, it's independent of the state, it follows that when I maximize over the state to get the channel quantum information, the same relation holds with this uh, same constant. Okay. 
to the between the imperfect case and the perfect case. So this is looks this 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 uh, rather innocent looking uh, lemma. Actually, um, it's not so innocent. I mean, it, we are going to use it uh, later. Uh, for the technical proof, I'll refer you to the archive paper. But for now, let me just quickly tell you, uh, I say the important properties about this gamma m. So, uh, so, okay, so this top line, I'm just copying from the, the previous slide. So in particular, if gamma m is one, that means the imperfect quantum fission information actually is equals to the um, perfect, uh, the case with the perfect measurement. So then the question is, when can we get what? Now, uh, if you the, the answer lies here. So if you look at this expression, this gamma m, which is sum over x of something like this, then uh, of course uh, this the, th the thing inside the summation can be expanded easily with uh, cauchy schwarz inequality, and therefore it's smaller equals to one here in the end. So then the question is, when can I get one? That means I get an equality sign here, and it is equals to one if and only if these two vectors are parallel. So in other words, square root mx, square root understood to be the operator square root of some this, uh, this state for all x, uh, is, uh, they are parallel with the one with the perpendicular version. So a particular um, uh, con sufficient condition where we can satisfy this is where all these mx are projectors. Because of course, for whatever input states, ultimately I'm still projecting to the same. I'm still live in the same space after the projectors. So, of, but this is a trivial conditions in the sense that we are back to the perfect measurement case where we are allowed to do the projective measurements on the MX. So this is the this is this is this is just a consistency check if you want. But then there's still another. Uh, interesting. Um, sorry, sorry. Yeah. One, one, one point I didn't. So you this proportionality in this uh, thing you can have zero sometimes. I I imagine right. You are yes, yes. Zero is allowed. Okay. Even zero okay. is proportional. Okay. Yeah. I don't know, but also mentioned that you need to find that there exists two epsilon and epsilon. It's enough to find an, a single. Uh, you are maximizing over epsilon and. Oh, xi, sorry, xi and xi. Yeah, yeah. So there's a maximization here. So I just need to find a pair that such that this is true for all x. So, so one 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 way to satisfy this equality is with pro, with projectors and projective measurements. Another way, another sufficient way, however, is as said, is uh, we have the mx times this um, cat is or uh, either either the one with this cat or the perpendicular one is equals to zero for all x. Yeah. So, and it need not be projective. So as long as for all x, either one of them is always zero. So in this case, this is of, this is equivalent to if you think of it in terms of the um, unambiguous state discrimination. That means you can identify from the outcomes. Always 100%. If you get uh, non zero outcomes, we can identify this either Kasi or Kasi pro. So, therefore, another sufficient condition in words is that uh, we can get gamma equals to one if this, me this, M, this measurement M can perfectly distinguish some particular pairs of orthogonal states. So, this, is, this will be a properties that we will use later. So uh, let me go with an example for now to, to just to... Uh, um, well, maybe a comment is long that yep. uh, this should be enough in a sense to answer Michal's question, no? I mean, if someone wanted to... So this structure one would need to investigate now for a given class of P of VMs. I think this this would you would like to see, Michal, that for example, projective measurements are sufficient. You need to prove that you can always find a projective measurement such that gamma m is maximal. It doesn't need to be one, but it's maximal. Great. Okay, yeah, so I, I would. Sure. I would think so. Yes. 
So, so this is a sufficient condition for even if I don't have a projective measurement, but along, about, as long as it satisfies this, it is still giving me the um, perfect QFM. Okay, so an example here, just uh, just 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 to see things very uh, explicitly. So as we know, uh, this is the simplest example where let's say we have an NV center, which is kind of can be understood as a, just a um, spin half systems, where the zero and ones are the energy level, uh, two particular energy levels, and then now if I put this NV center into a magnetic field, let's say pointing in the z direction, then it is kind of equivalent to a quantum systems where the the dynamics is governed by the h bar omega uh, h bar being one. Let's say it's just a Pauli z for the Hamiltonian, and then it generates a unitary, which is of course e to the i h theta, where theta is the frequency, the Lamar frequency that is uh, proportional to the gyro magnetic ratios, and of course importantly the strength of the magnetic field, and then for the time that you allow it to rotate as well. So in other words, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the theta and the strength of the magnetic field. And therefore, in this case, sensing the B is as good as sensing the theta. So this is an example uh, of uh, a very simple uh, quantum sensor protocol. But in particular, let us consider the input states of this um, form, which is in the equatorial plate. And then now then uh, upon the evolution from the dynamics, then it turns to this state. And then now the theta is encoded here in this uh, vector of phi, where phi is theta plus the initial state uh, parameter. Well, this is uh, also called phi. So now if you just look at this state, then if uh, you can, of course, for example, show that easily with the, again, the SLD formula, that the optimal measurement that you should use to, to extract the information about theta in this state is the states with the following, uh, is the measurement of the following uh, uh, P of M elements, which is uh, projective onto zero, zero, and one, one. But before that, you need to do a unitary rotation of, uh, this is like a pi over two pulse. You know, or in other words, actually, this is pi one phi. If I love to put the phi here, then there will be plus plus and minus minus. So, but this is mathematic. This is ideally what you would like to, you should uh, apply for the, uh, for the POVMs to extract uh, optimal information about theta in this state. But in the realistic scenario, however, I said, these zero and ones, they are encoded in the energy levels and we quite can't touch them but immediately. So rather what we can do actually is in the realistic scenario is we do an optical reduct. So what happens is that if it was one, for example, then you will find that you, you, you read the, the optical signal, you'll find a stronger signal as compared to when it was zero. Ideally, it's supposed to be completely dark, completely dark versus bright. But unfortunately, we don't have this uh, perfect contrast. So the bright and dark signals they actually have over, they are overlapping. So in particular, uh, you can either model this by a Gaussian or Poissonian statistics for the um, photon numbers detected. And with means that depends on whether it was zero and one. So if the, the means are very wide, much separated, then you, then you can tell quite with good confidence that, okay, it's quite dark, so it has to be zero, for example. When it's quite bright, it has to be one. But, when this, but then there'll be some overlap. And therefore now this overlap, this Poissonian is exactly the stochastic map that we had earlier. And therefore they will be mixing now the outcomes, which is now the photon numbers detected. So the X would be the photon numbers. So in this case, the X photon numbers, I mean, practic I mean uh, in principles can go from zero to infinity. So you have to sum them. And then now your official information you write it down explicitly, contains an infinite sum of this form. And then now the gamma m, which is also in this case equals to the imperfect channel k phi is the maximization of this quantity. And because of this infinite sum, uh, it's not very easy to, 
there's no way to have a um, closed form analytical solution for what is this F for any given phi. And also, if you want to find the optimal phi, the optimal input states, what is the in optimal input state I should use? So therefore, to deal with this, we have to go by approximation methods. And in fact, this has been done also in people in the, in the field of NV centers itself, which is the so-called um, threshold methods or we here call it the binning method. So what basically is happening here is that we have these uh, Poissonians at Z for of different means that corresponds to uh, whether it had been a zero, uh, uh, one or two um, into the previous perfect projective measurements. And then now we try to find where they overlap and then we put a cut here. And then we say, okay, for any, a photon number that we detect before the cut here, then it is more likely that actually it has been contributed by, for example, the outcome two, which in this case is the cat one or the cat plus. Um, and then uh, when it is higher than this threshold, then it's contributed by the another one. Of course, you kind of make a little bit more, uh, uh, you can think of this as like a cost grain. So actually you do cost grain on your noise. So for sure, your efficient information will not be as precise as if you could have done this perfectly. But then what it helps you is that now effectively you, you just have, for example, in this case, just a two outcomes, uh, perfect um, projective measurements into two outcomes of uh, imperfect measurements, labeled by x prime instead of x, now it's x prime. And which is, as, can be understood as an asymmetric big flip channel. So instead of an infinite, infinitely big um, stochastic map, I cross grain it into just a two by two uh, stochastic map. And in this case, what you gain is then you have now, you just need to do sum over two and then you, you can sum this uh, much easily. And it looks like this, for example. And of course you can still now consider more beans if you want. And then in, if you consider infinitely many beans, you are back to the initial problem. So you gain now, again, your Fisher information, but then you, your problem also gets tougher again. So, it, so it's, a, it's, it's, you need to find a balance, like, yeah. And usually with just two beans, usually you could get a good approximation. So we'll see later. So for now, just, I will just tell you that there's two beans, there's three beans, there are four beans. And two beans usually is not too bad. And another method is approximation methods if you are not doing binning is by considering lower bounds from the moments of the probability distribution. So we have this probability distribution. What we could do is we can construct approximates that takes into account only the first two K moments. So this will be again, also lower bounds on the fission information. But then again, if you take more and more and more, more and more moments, you recover back the full, um, uh, probability distribution, you get back this uh, infinite sum versions. But then now, if you just consider the mean, you will get the approximation. So just on the technical part, that's I think it's nice to share. The, the, der the, the derivation of this uh, lower bound situation are quite easy. So realize that any stuff that looks like V square over A, where they are real and particular A is larger than zero, can be understood as the, so the, the, the maximum point of the concave function of a quadratic function with the a and the b, two b as well uh, in the coefficients. So in particular, Fisher information, which is exactly this kind of b square over a term, but with x for all for each term. Therefore, we can map it exactly into this uh, maximization, uh, writing it as this way. And then now, instead of maximizing over this y x for each of the x, we can do a we can try to control it in a sense when we propose an ansatz, series ansatz, power series of this yx. And then now, therefore, the maximization over all these different yx is we turn it into a maximization of the coefficients in the power series. And how, we, how much we truncate the power series, the k, is then exactly what reflects in the moments of the probability distribution. So if you just do the math math mathematics, you'll find that you can write this nicely into a trace of two operators, one involves an inverse, where B is a column vector 
the, the B is the, is the rank one uh, operators where the, the vectors is just uh, basically the moments but with the derivative of respect to the theta. And then the A is just a square matrix with uh, moments of different uh, powers. So in particular, if you just work it out for let's say K equals to zero, K equals to one, you'll find that it's the K equals to zero tells you that the official information has to be larger or equal to zero, everyone knows. The first one tells you that, interestingly, it recovers the so-called error propagation formula. And then the second one will then includes more and more corrections from the higher moments. So the error propagation formula includes only the, the mean as well as the variance. Okay, so just, just show, the, show a figure to see how this approximation works in this case of the NV center. So let me just take some values of the mean values of the Poissonians. So these are experimental values. And then this black curve is the, is the, is the exact sum of x uh, uh, from zero to infinity, but of course, this is a pro approximate version of sum of only, what to, uh, only up to 100. And more is, looks the same. So this, this is kind of the, we could have just treat this as the exact official information. And then you see that the approximations from the two beans versions, the one of the three bean versions, as well as the uh, approximations of the lower bounds from the, including the first two moments, as well as the first four moments, they are of course uh, smaller because they are lower bounds than the exact fissure, but they're all approximate, they're getting better and better approximates to the exact one, but then with relative ease. I mean, just basically always just two terms or just need to consider the two or four moments. And moreover, the optimal angles here, they also getting uh, approximating it rather well. Okay, so this is- um, Sorry, can I ask, it's like a technical question. Some, some time ago, a few months ago, there were, there were some papers that considered lower bounds to quant, uh, quantum fissure information via polynomials. Like, is there some uh, via polynomials in states? So is there some connection between this approach and, uh, I mean, yeah. Uh, I don't see it immediately, to be honest, mm -hmm. but right. uh, you need to take it out. So, so I cannot say it with certainty now. Sure, yeah. Okay, so now, yes, now I'm moving on to this, uh, finally now to this uh, exciting situation where we now discuss the scaling. So now we have multi-prop quantum metrology scenario. So what is the situation? The, sit the situation is the following. We have uh, NQD props, which could be entangled here. So we just imagine we can arbitrarily initialize the states. And then we send them into independent and equal parameter encoding because we want to estimate the same, for example, the same magnetic field. So they are the same. And then after which, in the end, to extract the information, as said, we are going to do independent and by local measurements. And each of these local measurements could be contaminated by a noise. So therefore, now the structure of this measurement M here will have the structure of also a tensor product structure for the uh, overall uh, P of VM elements. And there, I say the reason why we consider this kind of uh, scenario where instead, of, where instead I have a big P here contaminating everything, for example, and we really have this local structure. The reason is that we know that if there's no such noise, this is exactly what is required. I mean, this is sufficient to get eyes on the scaling. We just need to consider a local measurement. So here we say, Okay, how about if I now have noises everywhere attached to these local measurements? So this is the setup we are looking at. And not to forget, in between the encoding and the measurements, we still have the control operations. Well, now these control operations, of course, ultimately can be understood as a change of measurement basis. But then in particular, we can consider two kinds of control operations. The first one is the global control operations affecting everyone here. And another one is a local one where just the effect is locally. So local 
for example, local uh, unitaries which are here. So, yeah, so this is, this is our main result also, which says that if I now really do a genuine global control operations, so then we have the following theorem. So for any encoded pure states uh, after here, the side N, and then any imperfect measurements M that has this structure, and it is not information erasing, I will say this more later, then, which is uh, operates independently on each probe, so it has this structure. Then the imperfect QFI converges to the perfect QFI when the N is large enough. So let's say the imperfect QFI process is from lemma one, is gamma M times this. And then now when N goes to infinity, so this gamma, this M contains N. So in the limit of N goes to infinity, this gamma M basically goes to one. So that's the point. And then I have this. So uh, another way to say theorem one is that there exists a global unitary of control here, such that in the large end limit, if we basically can ignore the effect of uh, imperfect measurements, and then your quantum fission information is then converged to the uh, perfect quantum fission information. So just one, uh, not, not to forget that I need to tell you with about this information erasing. So by information erasing, that, that is to say that these measurements are, these measurement operators are either all zero or proportional to identity. I mean, these are the useless kind of measurements where any states will give you the same statistic. So that is meant by information erasing. So any measurement that is not information erasing then no matter how lousy they are, as long as they are not perfectly information raising, then sufficiently large N, we could recover the perfect quantum fission information with some global control operations. Uh, sorry, I got, uh, can you repeat what uh, this uh, non-information erasing means mm -hmm. again? Sorry, I got yeah. uh, so, okay. so, confused. I mean, uh, any measurement, so any measurements for which the measurement operators are either are proportional to identities. So uh -huh. if, if all elements of the pure VMs are I proportional to identities or zero, mm -hmm. then these are useless. These are information raising. I see, I see. Yeah, because, mm -hmm. because the statistics is the same for any kind of states. Uh, sure, gotcha. Yeah. So, so, so in this result, you go like beyond this classical noise model. It can be like any, POVM, in fact, unless yes, it's trivial. In fact, as, as in, fact, in fact, it doesn't have to be this connected by this. So as long as it is, it still has to be low. It still has to be operates independently. In other words, it has to be as this form, tensor form. Yeah, yeah. The, so and like any POV, any separable POVM, which is not trivial, uh, basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yes. So this is theorem one, and okay, I, I just copy paste here. This is theorem one. The full proof is, okay, read the paper, please. But then let me just give you an intuition. Um, and in particular, recall what I tell you in the slide 13, which is the second sufficient condition such, such that gamma M is one. Remember this, that condition is that this uh, measurement is able to distinguish perfectly or, un un or un ambiguously a pair of orthogonal states, yeah? So, and then now you look at this, this kind of measurements, which, have, which, have, which, which has this form. Uh, uh, okay, let us now look at the one with this, uh, exactly this kind of form where I have a project, perfect, perfect, perfect positive measurement followed by the noise, stochastic map. So in this case, you can see that if I just have one of them, then of course I quite cannot distinguish perfectly um, uh, some uh, orthogonal states, but you have n copies of this. Think of it. And then now you can now distinguish the states with tensor n. As the n goes larger and larger, you can now distinguish perfectly these states. Yeah. So this is a little bit like I'm not, I'm not sure if I should put this too far, but it's a bit like a Shannon theorem where 
if you have large enough n out ultimately, you can, as long as it is not zero, I mean, the, the capacity is not zero, so to speak, you can ultimately you can squeeze some information out. So this is like this as well. So uh, or maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe that's not the correct analogy, but it's more like if I'm able to distinguish just one with one, uh, one copy with this amount of distinguishability, distinguishability, then if I have n of them, then I can only distinguish better. So this is the uh, so it's like amplification of distinguishability when you take copies, basically yes. of even classical probability distributions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but then, yeah, but then now more than that, I mean, as, as I say, this 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 condition is, uh, I mean, this this result term one is beyond this this form. So just now was the intuition that because then it's the same, then you can you can understand easily that if I have n copies, I get the same. But as I say it doesn't have to be this form. So the foolproof uh, the mathematical techniques in particular, can, you can see the, the, the theorem, but this is just for the intuition. Okay, yeah, so I'll still tell you a little bit how, how, how it was done. So formally, we show, we show explicitly how one can find a global unitary control, and we call it V5, such that the Fisher information for that any given states, and then couple with this, uh, control unitary, we can, we can show that it is lower bounded by something of the form uh, F, Fn, it's lower bounded by uh, a factor times the perfect QFI. And the factor is one minus Cn for some C that depends only on what is this choice and also the uh, imperfect measurements. So therefore now, if I think the N is going to be large, then one minus Cn is going to one. And then therefore, since the imperfect QFI is just the max, is, this is for particular VI, and then the imperfect QFI is for maximize over the V. So therefore, zero ones followed uh, immediately from here. So with this, uh, it also immediately follows that we have a corollary here, which says that now the Heisenberg scan can always be attained if, even if you have local imperfect measurements by considering a global control unitaries before the measurements. And then of course, then you still have to choose your input states to be the one that has a perfect QFI that is getting like an N square. Then you can correct it and then you can exactly this N square. So this, is, this, this is the first result. And we also extend these results to not just pure states because if you, let me quickly go back here. So we said, and, um, any pure encoded n qubit prop states here. But then you might ask, okay, how about if I have a little bit of mixed states? So we ans answer this partially by confirming that, okay, if I now have a mixed state, that is of the form of like a Werner state. So I still have this perfect um, encoded pure states, but now it's mixed, mixed with an identity. And then, then we show that now the, we've, with a, with a global control operations. The imperfect QFI still in the limit of large N converge to the perfect QFI, but now also multiply by the factor of how much you have in the, in, 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 in the mixtures of your pure states. Yeah. So if this is still N squared, then you're still N squared, but now you have a factor of R or the weight of the pure state. So just a demonstration. Again, we consider this, uh, uh, this simplest noise kind of, which is this asymmetric bit flip noise, which we have uh, earlier. And in this part, I'll just take some values, uh, P, Q, whatever, doesn't matter. And then I, cons then I have two, two, uh, two class of, uh, of uh, graph. One is for the uh, Werner states version. The other one is for the theorem one version, which is the, just the pure state version. In particular, I choose the GSC states because I know this is the one that gives me n square. So I plot the Fisher divided by n square, and so this this is the perfect this dash line is the perfect uh, one, this is the perfect QFI, and then this 
solid lines, the one Fn, the exact Fn. And then this is the lower bound. That is promised to have the one minus Cn convergence to the perfect QFI. And similarly for the mixed, for the Werner states version, where now it converges to the R, which in this case takes 0 0.7, so it converges to the 0 0.7 n squared. Okay. Um, sorry, can I ask? So this, uh, okay, it's a bit tricky question. In a sense, like, uh, so this control that you, up, sorry, this, uh, yeah, unitary control that you apply after parameter was encoded, like, I guess in general would depend on, on the parameter value, right? I imagine, right? Yes. Yes, okay, just wanted to. Uh, yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Okay. So, just like so it's like it's, it's 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 gonna be something that works for precise. It's like in the sensing kind of scenario when you perfectly know sort of you you probe for fluctuations around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay. So, oops. Yeah. So, okay. Now, finally, the really the last part. Now, so let's say. We're going to the third result where now instead of a global control operations, I have a, a, a operations which is local. So for each of them, I have one unitary, let's say. And I, I don't have a global one that mixes the, 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 whole, the, whole, the whole of the states here. So then the question is, can we still counterbalance this uh, effect of these imperfect measurements and recover the perfect QFI and therefore the Heisenberg scaling? with just this kind of uh, control operations. And the answer is no. And then we state this as a corollary tool, which says that uh, whenever we have a non-trivial noise, and I, again, I will tell you what is non-trivial. Okay, now focus on this scenario for now uh, with this um, perfect plus stochastic map, perfect plus stochastic map. So in this case, Whenever this stochastic map is non-trivial, and then if you try to compensate it by just local control, oper control operations, then you find that you cannot attain Heisenberg scaling, and then your mean square error follows at best with the standard scaling. So now to the problem is, what, is, what do I mean by non-trivial? So that means a noise is trivial when it is, for example, this stochastic map is identity then it is trivial. I mean, this, this, this noise is not doing anything. It's, it's not a harmful noise. So any noise that is non-trivial is any noise that really mixes up some of these outcomes here, even just two, for example. So this is what we mean by non-trivial. Any really harmful noise, put it in that way. So whenever you have any harmful noise, then you cannot attain high number scaling with just local control operations. So again, the proof, see the full proof in the uh, um, archive preprint, but maybe a little bit of intuition again. So one way to think about it is there's no, in, in the case of the global control operations, we somehow gained exponential, we have some exponential gains in, remember the one minus Cn, uh, with uh, global control operations. But here we don't have. Why? Because you can think of it that now when we are doing these local, local uh, operations, the amount of noise with, um, grows as much as we have for, as the number of probes. And then because we don't have these control co operations that we are allowed to rotate the space fully to avoid the noise, then the, the scaling now is additive. I mean, the noise is additive, and therefore we have like a ultimately constrained to be classical. So um, maybe another way to should I say this? I mean, okay. If but I, can I have a structural question still? So because you mostly focus on I think lower bounds in your so far in your talk, so you would need to. Uh, use some other techniques or to show in some other way that this maximization would be still, this uh, imperfect QFI would be still small in some way, right? So it's- We do upper bounds here, I think. 
it would be worth showing one slide in long with the upper bow. Do you have it or? Uh, for which case? Well, to prove what you just shown, we use upper bounds now. To this is Michal's what? question, and yeah, uh, there, there's, there's more later. Yes. Okay. Okay. So he will show it. Yes. Okay. So. Okay. So. Um, okay. Let, let me let me also try to uh, to give a little bit more on this intuition. I, I'm trying now, so I never tried this before. So let me see, because. Uh, I mean, in, in, okay, in this case, in this global case, I said first, you, you need to use a, a entangled states here, which gives you the Heisenberg scaling. So it is an entangled states. Okay. And then here to recover this uh, gamma m equals to one, and in this uh, kind of um, argument. So you need to use the global operations, which convert back to a, a local states, a product state. So therefore, this global control operations is, I mean, it's, it's generally global. You have to convert an entangled kind of back to this kind of product state. But then if you have a local measurements here, so you quite can, cannot convert, uh, con convert your entangled states into, into the product states. Right? So this is, I'm just trying to give the intuition. But well, like like either so it's like if you use product states to begin with you'll be bounded like by standard quantum limit and you can do yep. this amplification but if you are sort of entangled uh, like you are in ideal scenario uh, like you have Heisenberg limit but you can you don't have capacity to to put somehow the state in this product form approximately somehow yeah we went okay this, that's mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. at least yeah okay so Okay, so I, um, again, I still try to discuss a little bit on the formal sites on how to show that this is one over n scaling, the standard scaling. So, so just one, just one comment. We are like, as I mentioned in the email, we are very relaxed and like we start. So, but so it, it would be good if you could finish in like ten minutes. Uh, yeah. Ten minutes. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, formally. Uh, what 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 we used in proving this uh, standard scaling with uh, local control operations is we used the first thing we we use is this quantum classical channel. So so that means uh, now we attach for each of the outcome uh, this classical outcome x a fictitious and dimension uh, x dimensional Hilbert space. So x is the cardinality of the observed outcome x, and then so now. You can think of it actually in the end, what you get is a diagonal states in this flat basis. And therefore, then you can say you can understand this the change from this um, input states to this classical diagonal states in the end through a quantum classical channel, which is this cross operators. Okay. Then therefore, if I have this is just for one, and then now if I have n copies of this guy, then of course, then is then this this is a product. Product of these uh, quantum classical channels. So let me imagine call, call it um, capital gamma. And then, in particular, because of them being diagonal in this uh, flat basis, then if you, have a, if you have diagonal states, then and then the parameter doesn't depend on the eigenkets, then the, the, the Fisher information is exactly the, I mean, the quantum Fisher information. Uh, it's exactly the classical Fisher information of the eigenvalues, and which, of course, in this case, is exactly this uh, Fisher information of our case here. This, this classical Fisher information. And therefore, with this now, the point is now after we cast this in cast this into a version of a quantum classical channel, then we can use the known techniques of channel extension method. So this is some well-known techniques which I know, which I will not further elaborate. Just to say that the essence is. We know that efficient information of any channel encoding the parameter. Of course, if I maximize over all states, uh, if I extend it, it can only do better, not worse. So if I extend the channel with identity and then if I extend the uh, states, then I can only do better. And then it, it is the right hand side that there is no, there's, 
this well-known bounds, for example, by Fujiwara, also uh, make more explicit by Rafa, that there's a bound which we will recall as the channel extension bound, and which holds for any input from states row n. And therefore, furthermore, when the noise is non-trivial, as I said, so there's really some mixings going on, you can show that this bound, this bound is even now further limited by another bound, which I put AS for asymptotic. So it has some meaning, but just keep it as AS for now. Then finally, now we maximize over, because here this already includes all the states. So now the states part, like the maximization of states has been taken, taken care of. Then now we just need to maximize over the local unitaries. And then you can show that when I maximize over this, it is at most scales linearly with N times some constant C. And then this constant C can be computed with SDP, for example. And then therefore this proof completes the proof that this uh, channel quantum channel quantum fission formation for the imperfect case is at most scaling linearly with N. So yeah, so the question, so you see this is a upper bound. This is the upper bound on the fission, the fission formation, the, the imperfect fission formation. So of course, can it be saturated? And we show that, uh, of course, we are not showing for all cases, but for example, in this case of, um, again, asymmetric bit flip, we show that it can in fact be saturated asymptotically. So it can be saturated in particular if we choose a spin squeeze state, and then we measure it. Well, the, the corresponding total angular momentum in the x direction, for example, together with the imperfections. So it still has to be respected. Then this is what this graph is showing. So this is the, um, here I'm plotting the mean square error. So this, this is the inverse of this guy, basically. So now this is a lower bound now here for this here, for, for, for this uh, asymptotic. Um, channel extension bound. And then this red line is the exact um, imperfect QFI. Okay, well, I can only plot up to some small n. And then, so any, uh, uh, we can, of course, maybe for the, for the lower, for the upper bounds of the fissure, that means there are lower bounds of the errors, so here. And then we can show that, for example, if a spin squeeze states and the imperfect measurement, the imperfect total JX angular momentum measurement, we are actually asymptotically reaching the optimal lower bound. So this is this black curve. And of course, black, black curve is always on top of the red one. So the red one will be basically squeezed between this black solid curve and this lower bound. And since this black one is converging to the lower bound, lower bound of the MSE or upper bound of the fissure, so this red curve will also be squeezed uh, limit to the same limit. Okay, so I'm, so the, in summary, uh, in this work, the three main points I would say, the, the first one is to show how now, whenever we have imperfect measurements in this business of quantum metrology, the central quantity, which is uh, this quantum fission information now has to be modified. And we showed some methods for how to deal with it, to, to compute it, especially if you want to get the numbers. And then moreover, in terms of the scaling, we'll prove a goal theorem, which says that whenever we have this readout noise that is affecting um, separately on each of the, the local measurements, then by a global control operations applied before the readout stage, we can still restore the perfect precision and therefore the Heisenberg scaling. And then this fit cannot be however done with local control operations. And in this case, you will only always get standard scaling provided that unless your noise is not there, it's identity, otherwise it's always standard scaling. And we also have shown examples in, in saturating this um, either for the case of global, uh, for the goal theorem, we get how, how to get the, the, the control operations such that we get the Heisenberg scaling. Or for the Nogo theorem, how can we still get the optimal standard scaling if 
for example, the spin split states and the angular momentum measurement. And that's all. Thank you. Uh, cool. Many thanks Thank for for a very interesting uh, and informative talk in Glong. Uh, we have time now for questions, comments to the speaker. I have one, maybe. Please, Tomek. Okay, so, so so my question was, you were saying that uh, some, some slides uh, earlier that it is hard to evaluate or, or to calculate the quant imperfect quantum tissue information and, and, and stuff. Are there maybe works that are trying to like estimate this kind of thing or approximate it in some, some way? I don't know if it, if it even would make sense <laughs> anyhow. My understanding is, so I say we, we are here doing a general analysis. I mean, we are, we are kind of trying to, to be, we, we believe we are the first one to provide a general analysis on this uh, readout noise and imperfect measurement. But I say, and be, but in for some of the experiments and so on, in fact, people have, they, they realize this noise all the time, just that there isn't like a general analysis. And so they have ways to deal with it, but, um, tailored for their problem. For example, in the MV centers, as say, so there's, they have ways, they, they, precisely they propose this threshold method, for example, which is exactly this meaning method with two meanings. So I would say for some for specific um, questions, people have their kind of ad hoc way to deal with it. But um, in the most general sense, I believe there's, this is, what we are doing here is it's it's it's, it's basically the it's, it's as good as one can get. So, I mean, in general, I'm not sure, but yes, for specific for specific problems, and specific quantum metric problems, people have some ways to deal with their their, their own ones. Hey, that, that's fine. Thank you. So, any more questions, Phil? If you want to ask something. Ah, yeah, sure. I guess it's an obvious question coming from me, but like, have you uh, tackled the uh, the strategies which use classical post-processing um, in the as opposed to the, the global control operations prior to readout? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, this is this is this is something I think we should discuss and. My, my very nice understanding for, for, for now at the moment is this. Uh, so so what, what we have in the end is after the measurement, you get this, um, let me find my expression. So after the, after the, okay, so, so uh, the, the way I think about it is, first, what is the thing that we get on our hands is this um, outcomes of this X and then the probability distribution of it after new repetition. So this is what we have. This is the Q, this probability distribution. And then now you try to extract the, the hidden dependence of theta inside this distribution. So you can do, in my understanding, you can do whatever you want with this, with this distribution, this data, even set of data. But then if you are still restricting yourself to unbiased estimators, then for that given Q, this is the best you could get for your for your for your mean square area. So in other words, if you try to play with for example different techniques of extracting the data from still this same given probability distribution, you are basically just dealing with ways of uh, writing down an estimator. And if your estimator is still unbiased, then you you are still bounded by this Cromerov bound, and therefore. There's no. Uh, uh, yes, I understand. Yeah. Thanks. Um, any more questions? Okay, I have one. Uh, so you have this nice result that shows that some non local control can recover the scaling. But can you say something like, is it possible to say something about? complexity or about how this control so somehow looks like? Is it difficult to implement in practice? Uh, or is it like damn hard? Mm, okay, uh, if you're talking about in, so so here we have the, is it? 
Yeah. So, so theoretically, we show what is this. For example, we can always show we show what v you should use. Okay. So we have the theoretical expression, um, uh, like what v to use. But then, uh, okay. If you ask me in terms of implementing it, I'm not so sure how difficult it is. I mean, yeah, it has to be a highly, really global. So. Mm -hmm. I'm not very familiar, like for example, how to do it with, I think it depends on platforms, like sure. to realize it, um, but it does a complexity. No, what I mean is like whether maybe you can, you know, maybe some, you know, you show that single qubit gaze, like independent applications of, of a child don't work, but maybe, I don't know, when you stack together, to be the gaze in some simple RI, you know, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. so, okay. Yeah. So this one, I don't know. This one, I, I really don't know whether that was converting a GZ state into a product state, right? For example, this simple mm -hmm. example, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that already suggests you need to have unitary that creates GZ states, no, which, mm -hmm. which seems very like N squared. Kind of. No, uh, it, I guess you can, depending, you can do, I think, in law, depending on your locality, you can, uh, linear depth maybe suffices, or like, when you have no local, you can have log depth for that, but it's, uh, yes, yeah. So, so, yes, okay. So, the only intuition we have that, for example, GZ must be done. Sure. In local, local. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wonder, okay, this is just like some very general thing, like, but what, okay, this is because I like those objects, mathematical objects, so like, what, like, maybe if you play, if you put, I don't know, random unitaries from some, okay, maybe it doesn't make sense at all, because like the strategy here is like you want to somehow convert your initial state to those product states that are distinguishable in some, yes, like, and in between, just remember in between there's some coding, so the, yeah. So you need to be also always tailored to the parameter value. This is what already you asked. Yeah, I see. Because of course I would ask, okay, what if you put something according to some design <laughs> there? How would it perform? Okay, but this is like academic question. Maybe I don't know. Like yeah. as long okay. as long if you appro approximate some unitary, but you wrote you will rotate this design for one particular mm -hmm. uh, value of the parameter. I think this is the, mm -hmm. the, the important oh. part. So here, everything depends on the parameter value. Right, but okay, remember, okay, we have this, uh, like, remember in our, how it was, like in our old paper, yeah, like, like the, uh, yeah. we had some uh, funny thing that if we, uh, that in a sense, like we, we, we had high value of classical efficient information for all values of parameter, right? For yeah. for those random states, whatever. Like um, yes, but okay. We, okay, but yeah. okay, we need to I guess we, we will this would need to be another it's not that obvious, but I agree sure. it could work. It could work. Okay, are there any other questions to Inglong and Yannick? Okay, if not, let's thank the speaker again. Many thanks for, for thank joining you. us today.